just my face. That's better. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing today? You guys enjoy your B-sides? Yes. Yes? Yes? That's awesome. So I have a special affinity for this B-side event because I originated it um, about six years ago. I was the one who started to say, yes, San Antonio needs a B-side after being basically harassed into it by the other B-sides Texas folks, which included Michael Goff and Michelle Klinger from Austin and PFW there. So I'm very glad to see how wonderfully this has grown and how, I mean, oh, and there's Stephen, yay. Everybody, let's give Stephen a hand. <laughs> I handed this off to him three years ago, and it was like, I'm giving away my baby kind of thing. But every year he has improved this thing and brought more into it, and it's been amazing. No, no, no. So it's been, but it's been, it's amazing, and I'm very proud of you. Thank you. I'm the father sitting here starting it here. Thank you. Okay. And now the Mutual Admiration Society is done. So let's go ahead and move forward. really <laughs> new. Huh? <laughs> Only the old guy gets the joke, really. Oh, I don't even know what you said. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and tell you a little, about my, a little bit about myself. My name is Cindy Jones. Um, I'm originally from the Los Angeles area, and I went to, uh, I was a psych major in college. Um, human mind is really scary. It's a scary place to be messing around. The, uh, I took a, had some weird stuff happening with a couple of my classes, and then, so I took a break. And I was reevaluating what I wanted to do with my life, how I, where I wanted my career path to be, because clinical psychology was not, wasn't my jam. Turned out it wasn't my jam. But that's what college is for, right? To discover what the heck you're good at and what you want to do. So I ended up getting a temp job. This temp job had me doing, I was working for a computer peripheral company, so basically they were selling what they called multimedia kits, or CD-ROMs and sound cards in a box, and it came with all kinds of games. You would put this in your 386 or your 486 computer, and all of a sudden, you had sound, and you had CD-ROM, and you could play these awesome games. And I was putting, typing in model numbers and addresses, and I was bored to tears. So they saw that I was kind of poking my nose in areas that I didn't necessarily belong, it's just a little data entry person, and they created a role for me, and that was an associate tech. So, Time moves forward, I get better and better at my job. Um, I've been working, at, you know, doing, working on BBSs and stuff for years, right? I've been on BBSs and playing games and things for a really long time. So, and I knew how to troubleshoot, you know, my own modem. I could get a, figure out what COM port to put something on. So why shouldn't I be good at this too? So the evolution of my role within that organization started me at the very bottom of a data entry person and brought me into a spot where I was running all of their online services. Now, in all fairness, all the online services at that point in time was Prodigy and CompuServe, so it's been a while. I've been involved in this game for a little bit of, a little bit of time here. Um, so, what I found out during that time frame was computers just made sense, right? The human mind was a really freaky place to be. There were some abnormal psych, pl psych classes that I was taking, and I was about doing um, uh, a profiling for violent criminals, and it was, just messed up in there. So computers were logical. They did exactly what you told them to do, right? That appealed to me in ways you can't even imagine. Now, half the time that they're glitching out, it's still doing exactly what you told it to do, right? You just told it to do it wrong. <laughs> so be it. So that company went out of business. I got laid off. It was a mass layoff, which was really beneficial for me because I was able to go ahead and they provided retraining. Uh, the state of California at the time was like, you know, we will go ahead and give you, uh, you know, a certification course. Which would you prefer, Novell or Microsoft? Oh, well, Microsoft sounds kind of cool. I've been playing it. You know, I, I can hack into a registry now. I've been trying to make drivers work in this registry for these peripherals for months now. So yeah, let's go ahead and do this. So I ended up getting my MCSE with NT351. I have a six-digit Microsoft number, and it starts with a three. Wow. Once again, I've been in this game for a little bit. Um, so that's how I got into it all. That's how, that was my baseline for like really starting to get into computers and IT. Getting that certification was great. Got me into positions where I was able to start doing support for people. Because once again, you know, I was a psych major, so my, my thing is I like to 
help people. I want them to do, feel well, like they're doing well. And that's still what I'm doing today. My, I've evolved, you know, to now I'm, I'm running it. I work as a consultant, right? That's my jam. So I did a little bit. I've always done a little bit of the hacking side of things. When I was six, I took apart my grandmother's toaster. I couldn't put it back together. But one of those little red lines wasn't working, so I wanted to see what was going on with that. So couldn't get it back working again, but that's okay. So I've always done that. And one thing I found is that I, I, I like taking things apart. I want to find out why things are wrong. Human mind, once again, too scary a place to be messing around. But with computers, I could do that. So I did, I did, I did it well. Um, I've been going, started, you know, your, your natural evolution when you're going ahead and doing computer IT work, security just kind of happens, right? Nowadays, we were talking about this earlier in uh, the conversation we were having with uh, Kathleen in, in the uh, career track, that, you know, that just kind of, it, it just evolved for me. We didn't have information security majors when I was in school. You know, I was there to, I mean, if you were lucky, you could find something that had to do with computer information systems, but even that was far and few between, certainly not at the school that I was at. So, falling into security and realizing that you want to go ahead and protect what's out there just kind of happened for me. It was a kind of interesting, like an eye-opening experience for me because it just kind of fit so well. Because not only can I protect things, but I can also help the people and the organizations and the individuals that I'm there to represent and to go ahead and get them in a position where their stuff isn't being spread all over the internet, right? So falling back to that hacker lifestyle and everything else, I started going to DEF CON, I think it was 13 or 14, I don't remember. But I got a lot out of the classes, a lot out of the talks, excuse me, a lot of the talks. They weren't doing classes then. Um, one of the advantages to being me is that I was, I was a super timid individual. I would be like, I'd go to a talk and I'd go back to my room. When they started showing it on the TV at the rib, it was the best thing ever. I didn't even have to leave my room. It was spectacular. I never spoke to anybody. Ten years ago, if you would have told me I was standing right here, no. Not my reality. I just wouldn't, that wouldn't have been me. Um, but I did get a lot out of DEF CON and of the talks that I saw there. And I started feeling like I needed to get something back. So I started volunteering. Um, started off with B Sides Vegas, B Sides Austin. Ended up building, starting to build this, which was awesome. Um, and, and I swear there's a point to all this background information. I'm not just saying all this. The, uh, one of the, the culmination, recent culmination of all this volunteer work that I do, and I do a lot, was that DEF CON asked me to go for the first iteration of DEF CON China to help organize it. And I was like, heck yeah, I'm down. I'm going to China. That sounds awesome, right? So about 30 days ago, I got on a plane. I went to China. I helped organize the first DEF CON China, and it was amazing. It was such a cool event. Totally different than what you would expect from a DEF CON, right? But it was what it was because it was China. It's a totally different vibe over there. And you've got to do you. And it was an eye-opening experience as far as being in an area where nobody needs to speak English in China. So it was really interesting from a communication standpoint as well. So while I'm over there in this amazing country that I didn't really have a lot of time to, to check out, I realized that you know it's absolutely beautiful here, but the pollution was really, really bad. So I leave. I go ahead, we do DEF CON China, we have an amazing time. We leave there, and on the way back, I'm starting to feel a little meh, not feeling great. You know, it's been a busy few days, maybe I'm just tired. I land on Monday. Tuesday I'm home, I'm relaxing, and I'm writing this talk, because I have to give this talk in three days or two days time in Salt Lake City. So Tuesday, or uh, Wednesday I get on a plane, fly to Salt Lake City. Thursday I'm feeling kind of, kind of worn out get up in front of an audience. They put me in the big room. I had uh, like over, oh, last call, everybody, if you want beer. <laughs> last call. And feel a little worn out. Feeling kind of really, actually really worn out in Salt Lake City. I get up on the big stage where I'm standing in front of about 350 people, which was the most intimidating thing ever. Huge room. Never spent, I thought it was gonna be a breakout session. And I give my talk. Well, the next, that night, I get back to my hotel, and I'm sick. 
not just sick, but I've, apparently I've uh, contracted pneumonia. I have no recollection of what this talk was in Salt Lake City, so today it's going to be an adventure. <laughs> so it's just you guys are forewarned. <laughs> so basically this is not something you're not going to hear anything new here. You're not going to hear a single thing new. Once again, everything old is new again because the world is still an ugly place. Okay? My job as a consultant, I go out there and my job is to say, your baby is ugly. Your security program sucks. Here, 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 and here. Here's some recommendations so we can maybe improve things, right? And it can be anything from vulnerability management to you know, inventory systems to your dev shop is just running you know, hodgepodge all over you guys. What are you guys doing? on here. It could be just about anything. Um, and when, you go, when I go into a shop, nine times out of ten, the C-suite, they don't know what's really going on. They just, they just don't. You know, they're not the boots on the ground. They're not seeing the day-to-day -day operations that are happening. So you'll go ahead and I'll have a, you know, a kickoff meeting with the stakeholders, the upper level stakeholders. They're like, so what do you think? You know, go ahead and give yourself a score on a scale of you know, one to five. What's your, how do you think your security program is running? Oh, you know, I'd say we're a solid four. Okay, you're wrong. I can't tell them that right off the bat, but once I go ahead and start getting into it, I can start evaluating the organization, different aspects of it, and be able to tell them how and why they're wrong and what they need to go ahead and invest in. So, telling people that their baby is ugly is, uh, it's difficult in the best of times, but it can be straight out combative in the worst of times. So with the advantage of having that psych uh, this background in psychology, I am very strong in communication. And so being able to take it to that level, and we talked about this a little bit earlier as far as being able to communicate with different levels of personnel, whether they're technical, non-technical, leadership, whatever the case may be. But developing that skill set is very important, and maintaining that is extremely important to be able to get your point across. Um, so when you're going ahead and you're talking to these people and they're telling you their security programs are for and they're wrong, it's not their fault. They just, they only know what they're aware of, right? So going in and going, once again, just spending some time performing analysis, making the recommendations, helping them prioritize what they want to do next is super important. So when you're going ahead and talking to these folks, their first thing is like, well, you know, you're coming back here and you're telling us that on a maturity scale, we're, we're barely managed, you know, we're not, we're, we're not standardized. What are you telling us? We have a little five scale, uh, five tier scale that we use. And they're like, well, well what's missing from our, from our programs? Well, a lot. The first question that we have was, the first thing we got is, is basically knowing what you've got. It comes down to this. Like I said, there's nothing new in this talk. This is the same problems we've been having for the past 10, I'd go ahead and say 20 years. What do you have within your organization? What do you need to protect? What's out there for hardware? What's out there for software? What kind of data do you guys have? Are you maintaining it in, a, in a, a format that can be protected, depending upon the sensitivity level? Do we even have sensitivity, le sensitivity levels specified for your data? <laughs> what is, I mean, the reality is you don't. People don't. These smaller organizations, I learned a lot from the DOD where they actually are very anal retentive about categorization and classification. Um, are they really good at it? I guess that's up for debate. It depends on what you look at. So well, they know what classification is and lose it. They, do, they definitely know that. <laughs> they definitely know that. So how does this improve? I mean, how do we go ahead and get inventories of baseline systems, of software, of hardware and data? I mean, wh where is everything at, right? So this is how the one way that these guys are going to improve. And this is time and time again. This is what I say on almost every single engagement that I am on. I feel like a broken record. You don't know what you have your Excel spreadsheet over there, over there, and over there, which is, might be password protected, but probably isn't, but that doesn't matter because it's sitting on a file share that everybody has access to. People just can't wrap their heads around what they're doing wrong. So, understandably, a lot of times we've got IT shops that are also working as security practitioners. That's problematic, right? There's too many hats. You just can't do everything and keep the business running at the same time. So, has this gotten any easier? I mean, are there ways to go ahead and do this? One of the, uh, there's a few different reasons or aspects of things that are, are helpful that we should be able to leverage within you know, the technology that's available to us right now. Um, 
Enterprise licensing, for example, should make software licensing relatively simple, right? I mean, you've got enterprise licensing for your operating systems for the most part. You've got enterprise licensing for you know, office, office products, whatever the case may be. Um, if you're running, you, know, you can go ahead and leverage different aspects of uh, configuration management tools for any operating system, for pretty much any piece of software. But knowing what's out there is pretty limited. Um, patching. You know, we can go ahead and use everything from WSS in conjunction or without, without a conjunction with SCCM. You can use Puppet, Jamf, whatever you want to do. You should be able to keep your stuff up, patched up, right? This stuff should happen. It's not happening. Um, standardization. Once again, you can go ahead, you know, most of the space of the world runs on Windows. It's, you know, SCCM is a great way to go ahead and ensure that standardization is being maintained. Your configurations are being maintained using all the aspects of group policy. Do the stuff that matters. Make these <laughs> images secure before you're kicking them off. Um, your virtualization of hardware assets, that should be really simple. You go ahead and bring it up off of a template, which is hopefully pre-hardened. This should be making life easier, but it's not. Uh, your asset management tools, having that information coming out directly out of your ESXi you know, console, plugging right into your asset management tools so you'll be able to keep abreast of what's going on in your virtualized environment. That should be happening. It's not. So we've got a lot of challenges. You know what's sad? They're the same challenges we had 10 years ago. Once again, nothing's changed. The technology names have changed. The, the, the malware out there is different. The vulnerabilities, sometimes those aren't different because we're still looking at 08, 063 is still out there. Um, organizations are running just old, old legacy applications and systems and they had say, oh, we can't upgrade. Well, Sunday you're gonna have to. Cindy, is it, is it a, just the tools are bad? Do they have the right tools? They just pull they don't have the right tools. They don't have the, well, they, they may have, that's the thing, they may have the right tools, but they don't have, the, they're not using them in the right way. The processes. Yeah, the processes are junk. You know, you got people processing technology. The technology for nine times out of 10, you got the snake oil, people, people are selling the snake oil, and they're doing a good job of selling the snake oil. But nobody finds out how to use it. They don't have the personnel in place to be able to leverage that. That's half of it. People, you know, and us in security, as a security practitioner, you will never be out of work. That will not take place unless you are being really picky and very specific on what you want to do. But there is work out there. I mean, I, if, and, and you don't, if you want to take some time and not have a job and just kind of sit back and figure out what your options are, you have that option. Because you're an InfoSec. We are so highly sought after that you have the pick of the litter. Unfortunately, on the flip side of that, the organizations who need people are feeling that. So we have the biggest issue there as far as getting the right, I'm going to say this and I kind of hate the fact I'm saying it, the right butts in the seats, right? The people who actually know the technology, who know how to run this stuff, and who effectively can go ahead and manage processes, who can go ahead and enforce policy, assuming the policy is written appropriately. We'll get into that in a minute, because it never is. <laughs> so let's talk about our current challenges as far as like software goes. Um, from a software perspective, we've got people running local admin, they're installing whatever the heck they want, it doesn't matter, there's no blacklisting of applications taking place because that technology was only rolled out halfway, you know, whatever they had, it's only rolled out halfway to do antivirus. There's no whitelisting or blacklisting because that's too hard. That would take too much time. Once again, you're halfway using your tools. Um, patching. It's a legacy system. We can't patch that version of Java. If we do that, what's going to happen? The world will explode. We'll never be able to access the system again. Are they putting it off anywhere, like sandboxing it at all? Maybe going ahead and using some kind of a, you know, Citrix client or something to access it? Or not. You're still accessing the same torn up, nasty website that might be only be internal, but can't even prove that. So the uh, standardization, we're doing standardization. Oh, we can standardize our desktops. All of our desktops are on the same image. Well, that's great. Did you harden that image? Did you take the time to configure that image with the GPOs, with patch policies, with whitelisting and blacklisting technology? Did you go ahead and take, take the initiative to implement the tool set that you already have in place completely and fully? 
Did you think to go ahead and hire a third party on a contract basis to get this moving to where all you have to do is en enable your users or your uh, administrators to strictly administer it, as opposed to having to set something up from the ground up? Leverage these things. Not happening. Um, and then you get me into bold management. Um, so this is one of the ugliest areas, one of them, there's a few really ugly areas, but vulnerability management programs, I see them in all levels of maturity. Uh, we don't want to hit our network devices because it'll take them down. Really? Maybe 15 years ago. I mean, maybe you should upgrade some of those network devices because if their IP stack can't handle a vulnerability scan, you're in really bad shape. You know, what, what's happening here? Um, other places, oh, we don't do anything over wireless. Well, when you think about walking into an organization that runs everything on wireless now, everybody's got a laptop and you're walking in there and everything's connected via wireless, not a single one of those hosts is being hit. They don't want to do loan scans over wireless. Why is that? Well, we've never been able to do it successfully before. Well, why is that? Once again, process issues. When we go ahead and look at hardware issues, the challenges associated with hardware and system, I'll call uh, systems for lack of a better term because say hardware, I'm still also referring to virtualized systems. Um, back in the day, we had desktops. Very few people had laptops. Laptops just weren't, you know, very few people needed to be mo a mobile, part of the mobile workforce. Nowadays, almost everybody gets a laptop. Um, the, I mean, you had a three year refresh. You, if there was a hardware vulnerability, Nine times out of ten, you were heading, it was probably going to be fitting something that was older anyways. It wasn't going to be the latest, greatest technology. So it was going to be rotated out anyways. You're always on a lease program. Nobody's buying things. It was all leased. So there was that aspect. BYOD, never heard of it before. Now what have you got? Uh, when you're looking at virtualization, if you're talking about, you know, I've mentioned before, dev shops, bringing systems up and down and up and down. You can't keep track of that. There's just no way to do it unless you actually have something feeding into an inventory system that's going to give you that information. So ensuring that even the hardware vulnerabilities that are going to be present or the virtualized versions of those vulnerabilities that are going to be able to be managed, it's almost impossible. Has that changed at all? No. Um, the, the cloud. Shiny, give me a new instance. Oh look, I don't need it anymore. Take it back down. What's in that instance? What was in that instance? Who's transferring data to that instance? What's it for? We just have that information. It's, just, it's the same kind of thing as virtualization. There's just no way to keep track of it effectively. Or there's no, I shouldn't say there's no way. I don't see it effectively being managed. Um, you can look at your asset management systems and see if you can do some automation there. They're not necessarily, I haven't seen a very successful asset management system. Uh, very successful implementation of an asset management system that was able to go ahead and maintain that uh, kind of information. The customization that would have to take place between all the cloud environments, uh, between the AWS, the Azure instances, your virtualization instances, what people are running on their desktops, they're bringing up their own, you know, bringing up their own VMs on their desktops, keeping track of that information. That's really difficult to find, very difficult to manage, almost impossible to go ahead and include in asset management. So what does all this equate to? Basically, for lack of a better term, rogue devices. These are things that your IT shop, your security shop, nobody knows they're out there. What do you do about that? You've got systems that haven't been patched in how long? Because once again, they're on the wireless. They can't do any vulnerability scans. They certainly can't be aware of the latest patch that they get pushed because they're only checking into WSUS once in a while because, well, we don't go ahead and require anybody to go on the VPN. We're not using the uh, asset man or using our patch management system appropriately, it's not checking in with home. It's just going about its business. You know, people are just going about their business on the outside of the world. So, so what can you do? I mean, you've got everything under the sun here. We've got options with BYOD. You, it, it's, it's, it's a losing battle, right? It sounds like a losing battle. What are you gonna do? Oh, we've got zero trust. That's it, that'll save the world, right? Well, you guys can't even manage your patch management program. You can't manage, I'm not saying you guys, I'm not pointing for at you guys, but you guys being organizations out there, their zero trust is only gonna be effective as your ability to effectively manage the certificate authority, pushing those hardware certs out, and ensuring that they're useful, right? So that is a solution. 
Probably not if you can't get your patches pushed. Okay, data challenges. For goodness sake, do a data inventory. Every organization in the world should do a data inventory. I probably can count on one hand of the, since I've been with my current employer, probably been about, the only people I know who have solid data inventory, let's put it this way, the only people I know who have solid data inventory are legal teams, legal offices. That's the only place I have found it. Medical offices, they might think they do, but they don't. It's really, you just can't, it, you can't wrap your head, hands around it. There's always gonna be an Excel spreadsheet somewhere. It's gonna have social security numbers, medical diagnoses, um, whatever the case may be. Credit card information, if you're in a nightmare scenario, but that's entirely possible as well. But it's almost impossible to go ahead and wrap your arms around it. For whatever reason, the lawyers have got it right. I'm seeing them doing it appropriately. I don't know how. Now these are only the ones I've seen, so, and I'm not one, so don't hold me to this, but. They're doing better than most. Um, policies are the first step. Understanding categorization, classification. Having those policies pushed out to everybody in your organization so they're aware of what to be, be on the lookout for. If they have any kind of, uh, if there's any uh, vari or, uh, variances from what they know to be the fact that the policy that they need to be pushing against, they need to be brought, you know, they need to be able to bring that to somebody's attention. They need an escalation path. Please give them an escalation path. Include that in your policies and procedures. It really hurts if they just say, well, I saw this, but I didn't know who to talk to. They talk to their boss. Their boss says, well, I saw it, but I didn't know who to talk to, and it never goes anywhere. They need to have avenues of reporting this information. Um, so data flows, that's something else that when I worked for the DOD, I have to say, that was the most, I learned so much from looking at data flow diagrams for any system, network, or overall environment, right? Having that information spelled out, there will be information going from this web server that will be taking place coming in over 443, over 443 going down going to this application server, then to this database server with port information specified. You know exactly what traffic is supposed to be taking, part, taking place on your network, right? be able to monitor that information, to know when some strange traffic is taking place, seeing your database server talking to some kind of random, whatever it may be, some, and attempting to get out, that's problematic. This should be important. This should be brought to somebody's attention. But people aren't even aware of the baseline communication technology. They don't even see the communication paths that they need to be, be aware of as a baseline yet. So one thing that I always push is uh, the ability to have your data flows diagram across the board, at a system level, at a network level, just throughout the organization. So, and, it, and have the appropriate protections put in place. My goodness, it's data. Just, are, are you alerting on this data? Are you, are, are these, you know, having that baseline established and monitoring for anything, but when you've got the protection mechanisms in place, just verify, are you alerting on this information? Are the alerts so, cumbersome that people are ignoring them because they're just too much, you don't have these use cases set up with your so. I mean, how bad can that get? Alert fatigue is a real thing, and let me tell you, I routinely filter things into a folder because I just don't have time to deal with it. I can't imagine somebody who's getting, you know, 75,000 of them a day. You're never gonna look into everything. Those aren't alerts. Mm -hmm. Those aren't alerts. No, they're not spam. They're not, they haven't figured yeah. out what the hell an alert is. Yeah, exactly, it's, it's spam at that point, it's useless. So, how do we meet some of these challenges? Believe it or not, there might be a light somewhere at some the end of some tunnel. It's not all doom and gloom. It's not all horrible. Um, there can be beautiful babies out there. They're not all ugly. There really can be beautiful babies. Um, how can we change it? How can we get things from the state they're currently in into a more positive, more mature environment to where we can feel confident that our data as individuals and corporate data is being protected. That sounded really positive. I hope it's true, but it's been a long time and it still isn't much different. Um, securing what you got. Uh, protect all of your sensitive data. That means encrypt. Encrypt again and encrypt some more. Encrypt in transit, encrypt at rest, encrypt in the database, just encrypt stuff. 
it's not, you have one encryption system out there, you're keeping track of one set of keys, you can do that for more. Encrypt some more, just keep doing it. It's fine, <laughs> this is fine. It's not gonna slow down your, it used to be, I used to have people say, well if I go ahead and enable uh, table space encryption on my database, that's gonna slow down the application too much. You know what? Nobody's gonna see it. Nobody's gonna notice it. If you're in a trading company, if you're working for like a, 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 a stock market trading, trading organization, yeah, I can see it impacting you there because we're talking milliseconds we need to worry about. But when you're in your standard environment, you're, nobody is gonna notice that. Please encrypt. Um, go ahead and specifying access control. Monitoring, <laughs> my goodness, monitor and fine tune your alerts. Get somebody in there to help you. <laughs> to have somebody go ahead and say, no, this is useless, this is a false positive, it's been flagging for six years now and it still doesn't matter, and it really didn't matter because nobody was taking action on it anyway. So even if it did matter, it's a foregone conclusion, you're already pwned. Um, <laughs> pushing for secure development, training your devs. My gosh, train your devs. Um, which rolls right into education as well. Let people know what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, and what secure use of an information system is. You know, you just said that in a university that trains the dog. <laughs> but are they training them securely? I don't think so. Okay. So there's your question. Are they getting security training along with their development? Okay. So how are we securing the data? Um, only those who need access get access. Encryption, encryption, encryption. Know where it is. I'm, I kind of feel like I'm repeating myself because somebody needs to because nobody's changing anything over the past 20 years, people. This is something that needs to be addressed. Um, you've got, we've got to get back to basics and go ahead and start doing this. So Cindy, if, if I'm encrypting my database, mm -hmm. and I'm encrypting my application and all the communication in between, mm -hmm. If it sits on the internet, they're coming into the application layer which already has granted access to the database, so the fact that it's encrypted doesn't really matter because I'm a fold of the application. Oh my now God. secure development is important. Yes, exactly, and that's one of the reasons why we have to go ahead and ensure that this is built in from the baseline. Education and not just awareness training, which don't get me wrong, I'm pro, very pro-awareness training, needs to happen, but secure development needs to take place. And everything goes along with that. That includes code testing, peer review, static, Buzzing, I don't care what you're doing, application pen testing, across the board, this needs to take place. All this information needs to be addressed before it gets to the point where it's in a production environment and that thing's facing up the internet and some, some little, some kid who's having too much fun on this neat little application decides to go town on it or whatever, whatever other you know, bad actor you want to consider. So, uh, going and securing, once we go ahead and secure the data, we need to go ahead and secure your access. Um, role based access, it really is a thing. Stop giving everybody access to the world. In some of these smaller organizations, they, know, they just say it's easier. And I get that. Um, because they have, you know, three guys running IT. One of them is now the official head of security, and he can't manage all of it. Being able to go ahead and specify the roles. Getting to ap the application layer, specifying roles within there. Scary to say, one of the most impressive role-based access control systems I've ever seen is a very large um, HR application. I was working with the Air Force, and we were determining they were. It was for the Air Force uh, Personnel and Pay Systems, the AFIPS program. It's a congressionally mandated program. It was going to take, uh, I think it was 163 disparate Air Force personnel and pay systems, which includes everything from leave time to bonuses to sign on, but everything, I mean, everything. They were going to combine all of this into one beautiful system. This is, that, that was their goal. And the program, I don't know where it sits today. Um, I got out of it about three and a half years ago. Thank goodness. Um, but as a part of that, we were, we were performing what we consider to be the beginning of the blueprinting stage of this new shiny system. And it was, I have never been more impressed with the granularity 
of the, applica the application level for those users. Um, this was using PeopleSoft, so you can take that as you will, but the granularity that was present there and the ability to create custom roles to access various aspects of data was so impressive to me. I was just like, wow, this is amazing. Um, I've recently seen the same type of granularity um, in Salesforce. Um, applications like that, they've got it down. You know, if you have the opportunity to see the security settings for any of these applications, take that, learn from it, and apply it to the rest of your world. I mean, you'd be amazed at what you can actually do to go ahead and narrow down the, the, the scope of what somebody has access to, therefore narrowing down the scope of what they can potentially damage. Um, stop giving people local admin. Please stop giving people local admin. Uh, in addition to that, go ahead and make sure that your domain admins are reasonably assigned if necessary. If they only need privileged access for specific tasks, give them access for those tasks. They don't need to have domain admin to do their job nine times out of 10. Be sure they're using run as, for goodness sake, don't let them, make sure they have two separate accounts so that their general user account doesn't have admin, domain admin rights. These are very basic concepts that are still ignored. I gotta hire more people to manage my systems. That's why they're local admins. I hear that all. <laughs> yeah, well, you should probably hire more people. Okay. Actually use the configuration management yeah. software to patch you? Yeah. Hey, what a great idea, use the tools. Here's a thought, have room. a software installation repo. <laughs> we'll get into that in a second. <laughs> We're covering that in just a minute. Um, be sure to monitor your highly privileged accounts as well. Not only when you're at, providing the access to folks, go ahead and be sure that you're looking at the access that they're having. Having the two accounts, one user base, one administrator base for any kind of elevated privileges is imperative, especially when you're going ahead and tracking things down. It just makes it so much easier to see this domain admin wasn't just Joe Q, you know, first dot last. It was first dot last dash A. Whatever the case may be. Have some kind of designator so these people are you're aware that this is a highly privileged account and have education and teaching them how to go ahead and what the responsibilities are for using using those accounts. Um, monitoring them, make sure that uh, you want to look for not only failed login attempts, but you also want to look for any kind of long term um, absence of logins and then a plethora of them. So these people, are, these are the kinds of people who are sitting there, they have these accounts, they don't need them until once a month they have to run a report and they need uh, you know, elevated access to do it. Find a different way to give it to them. It really isn't that hard. You look at a, you know, if you go ahead and you look at the, the way that the systems are configured and, and what the processes are that, are that need that type of access, you can go ahead and get very granular, once again, going back to that granularity level, of providing the specific access they need. Um, and alert. Once again, get your alerts in place and make sure that they're seeing them properly. Um, you, so when you've got 35 systems out there, you've got your, your uh, carbon black running, you've got your uh, whatever, I mean, we, so yeah, carbon black's not a good example, but you've got like, say you've got like 30 systems and everything, you, providing information all over the place. You've got your Windows logs, you've got the logs you're pulling off of your, your NetFlow data, you got everything going into your one you know, con uh, network configuration system, and you're having to monitor each of these individual systems to go ahead and get useful data. Stop doing that. Find a way to consolidate all this information. Pull all this information to together. Develop use cases based on that single, that single lens. It's a much more effective way to manage your security than going ahead and having to look at different consoles for different things across the board. It's one way where a lot of things slip, by the, slip, slip through the cracks for weeks, potentially months. Um, but I don't know if the, I don't even remember what the DBIR this year said for the length of time between a realized, the problem is that those are for Verizon. No, I understand. I mean, these are reported. Clients, this is yeah. for, this is reported. But I mean, it's it's a, it's a solid. People understand this. Did I think last 20, time it was nine months. Twenty-two days, I think, for their clients that did it well. So yeah, who did it well? <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, having that slip by just on your own side—that's just devastating. 
Um, go ahead and include NetFlow data. Anomalies will pop up. You'll see the differences there. Uh, collect log data from workstations. That's where nine times out of ten you're going to see activity starting. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And Michael's got products. <laughs> as well as some great cheat sheets. Spectacular cheat sheets for that. Um, look at the information that's coming across your workstations. Not just, don't just rely on your antivirus or whatever the case is to go ahead and provide you, you know, anomalous activity which may not be sufficient. Uh, develop use cases for uh, user behavior. Go ahead and leverage UBA. It's important. If all of a sudden Joe, who's sitting next to you normally, is logging in from, I don't care, wherever, Egypt, and you know he just took his wife out to dinner, there's a problem there. Somebody's got access, right? So go ahead and build out use cases for UBA. <sighs> Here we go, secure development. Bring security in at the very beginning of any project. They can throw the red flags in the very beginning so that you're not having to go back and fix things. If you're a developer, bring security in. Make them your ally. Find out what it is you need to know. Get training. Call OWASP. Say, hey, OWASP, come on down and do a lunch and learn for us. We'd love to hear you talk. Because we, wanted, we need to know on the, on the platform that we're building on, we need to know that what the situation that Michael developed, described earlier, where the application layer is, or the web app is the problem, but that's not happening. That's not the reason for the failure. Teach your devs how to code securely. Um, use dummy data sets in, in development, please. Stop using <laughs> production data in dev. That is just expanding your, the, the potential for breach across two completely different environments. Oh, but it's segmented. Really? How flat's your network? Who's managing that? Have you tested it? You've gone for, has dev ever been the goal on a pen test? No? Yeah. Um, Limit access to production. Stop giving your devs access to production, for goodness sake. Let them push up to a, you know, have it very specific on who can push things into production. Stop giving them access to production. Um, yeah, stop giving them access to production. It's not necessary. If they're using it for troubleshooting purposes, then have a duplicate set. Simple as that. And finally, my favorite, favorite topic is education. Because I still believe that there is hope. Believe it or not, with all my grumpy and my complaining <laughs> and my, my turning into my mother and finding fault with every single aspect of every single thing in my life, career and personal life, I still believe that there's a, there is hope. So the only way that this is gonna happen, go ahead and get your users trained. Get them trained on security basics. Um, high value account holders, C-suite, anybody who's hot with high visibility, give them specialized training. They're the potential targets of you know, a lot more phishing activity than Joe Q user is. Make sure this is happening. Um, focus the security training on the whole. Make sure that your development shop is getting their training, but also make sure that your administrators are getting the appropriate training there. They need to know that they are also a high value target, and once again, because you're probably not using dual accounts, that their user account is this that much more valuable. And make them sure they are aware of this. Make sure they sign off on their responsibilities. That they are aware, protect, that they need to protect that account. Excuse me. Perform baseline and ongoing testing of educational effectiveness. Sounds really good. So if you don't have a uh, security awareness program in your, in your shop at this point in time, I would strongly suggest you guys do some sort of phishing exercise. Um, and I see this a lot. A lot of places just don't have security awareness training. And it ends up being one of my top five recommendations. Go ahead and make sure this starts happening. But develop a baseline. Do a phishing engagement. Hit the whole darn company. You know, make, get, do it well. Use a, use a service to do it. I mean, um, Rapid7 has a, um, an aspect of Metasploit now, or we've had it for a while, but it's getting pretty sweet. It's pretty nice, fun to play with too. Um, that I will recommend because I work for Rapid7. But go ahead and uh, 
or, or hire a professional organization. I think Fish Me still does a pretty decent job. Um, I see Larry up there, so I know you guys do some fishing exercises at Digital Defense, and they're local. Fish Me is now Co-Fence. co thank you. I knew there was something with Fish Me that just happened. I just wasn't remembering what it was, because, you know, I had the money. That just makes so, so much more sense. <laughs> So yeah, but go ahead and develop a baseline. See how your, your organization spins this the first time. See how it affects them. Um, perform user awareness training. And never, ever, please, for the love of all that is holy in the world, do not make it anything that can be punishable. Behaviors should not be punished. They are really should be opportunities to learn. Please treat your users as if they are learning something and they shouldn't be targets for your kind of, your, your negative, feedback. Um, but go ahead and do that baseline, develop that baseline, see where you're at initially. Rerun that phishing engagement two months after they do the training. See how it evolves. See if anything took. Maybe you need to revamp your, your education. Maybe your education program isn't the best in the world. Maybe there's a different way to present it to them. Doing lunch to learn. You know, keep being constantly making sure that people are engaged with their education is important, right? If you're just sitting there clicking through a CBT every year because it's required, because you know, you've got to go ahead and find where that floppy disk needs to go when you're getting rid of it. You know, that's not going to do anybody any good. So go ahead and engage your audiences on an individual level, maybe on a group level, uh, maybe on a role-based level. But general security awareness education needs to include all aspects of your organization, including your marketing department. So this is something that I don't, I love talking to the people in marketing and saying, we need to go ahead and build out a security awareness training program. But we want to have a mascot. We want this mascot to be everywhere. We want posters up on the wall with this mascot, with security awareness tips. We want little squishy dolls that we're going to hand out to people in, whenever we have our little powwows in the lobby, you know, giving out fresh donuts or whatever. And they're going to get those then, too. They're going to get them as prizes, along with a $5 gift card to Starbucks. And they're going to get this for participating and responding to security awareness training events, right? Make it a thing. Have them bring it home. Let the lessons be transferable to their lives. That's how you're going to go ahead and make a difference and get people to actually pay attention. So as I said, I, I'm really passionate about education here as far as user awareness training. OK, so that's me. That's my talk after being on a, Absolutely, literally laying on, well, I think it was my deathbed for six days with pneumonia, coming back from DEF CON. So, anybody have any questions? Yeah, you no? Know? Okay, I'm done ranting. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>